Joe Biden delays calling Florida Governor Ron DeSantis before Hurricane Ian slams the state. The White House fights to trans the children while blaming Russia for a weakening economy. And right-wing parties gain steam all over Europe. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. Today's show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Protect your online privacy today at expressvpn.com slash Ben. We'll get to all the news in just one moment. First, as you know, our government is addicted to spending. That reckless spending is driving up costs on literally all the things. Not fair, but you don't have to be a victim. You should lower costs where you can. This is why it's very foolish of you if you're spending too much money on your cell phone coverage. You're spending a lot of money with Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, you know, the big guys. You're paying too much money. Instead, you should switch on over to Pure Talk. Pure Talk will give you unlimited talk, text, Six gigs of data for just 30 bucks a month. That could be a huge savings for you and your family. That's grocery money or gas money. And PureTalk never raises their rates. By switching over to PureTalk, the average family of four is saving over 75 bucks every single month. Customers are realizing they simply don't need as much data as they thought they did. Join the hundreds of thousands who are making that switch over to PureTalk today. When you switch to PureTalk with my special discount, you're going to get 50% off your very first month. It's a huge offer. Just head on over to puretalk.com. Choose your plan. Enter code Shapiro for this special offer. That is puretalk.com. Enter code Shapiro. You get 50% off your very first month of coverage. Again, don't spend with the big guys. There's no reason to do that. Instead, switch over to a company that's going to save you money. Also, they kind of don't hate you, which is good. A lot of these big cell phone companies don't share your values. That is not the case with Pure Talk. Head on over to puretalk.com. Enter code Shapiro. Get 50% off your very first month of coverage. Also, this is a busy time of year for me. We've got Jewish holidays right around the corner. Got a lot of travel coming up, but I can rest easy because my home is completely protected. That's because I rely on Ring Alarm. I know what you're thinking. Wait, doesn't Ring do the video doorbell? Yeah, they do the video doorbell, but they also do an award-winning alarm system. That system makes available professional monitoring when you subscribe. Best of all, you can easily install it yourself. And Ring didn't stop there. They've changed the home security game entirely with Ring Alarm Pro, which is why I've decided to team up with Ring. When it comes to protecting my own home, I've gone pro with Ring Alarm Pro. Ring Alarm Pro is whole home security with available professional monitoring when you subscribe to Ring Protect Pro. Ring Alarm Pro combines a security system with a fast Eero Wi-Fi 6 router for home security and network security all in one device. Plus, with a Ring Protect Pro subscription, which is indeed an amazing deal, I get professional monitoring for the ultimate peace of mind. If anything happens, professional monitoring will call me and can request emergency services. So whether I'm across the country or across town, I know everything at home is protected and connected and that it will stay that way. To protect my home, I've gone pro with Ring Alarm Pro. You should do the same. Learn more at ring.com forward slash Ben. That is ring.com forward slash Ben. All righty. So as you may have noticed, we are not actually broadcasting from our usual studio. Instead, we are broadcasting from my home. Actually, so if you hear screaming children in the background, that is because there is a hurricane that is currently hitting the state of Florida. The current status as of this morning was that this thing was trending from a cat four into maybe a cat five. It is likely to hit Orlando. It's likely to hit the panhandle. It it really is, is kind of hitting the middle to the upper end of the state. We are not in that part of the state, but the the sort of dirty side of the storm is hitting where we are. So that means that we didn't want too many of our employees coming into work today because obviously it's not particularly safe on the roads. According to the Wall Street Journal, Ian Sensor was forecast to approach the West Coast on Wednesday afternoon. The storm strengthened to a Cat 4 hurricane early Wednesday. It's expected to make landfall between Tampa and Fort Myers. It's a shift south from the earlier forecast that puts a lot of people directly in harm's way. Almost 2.5 million people are under an evacuation order right now. The latest forecasts say that the storm surge could be the highest up to 12 feet from Naples to the Sarasota region. If what happened in Cuba is is any sort of indicator, things could get extremely rough. Cuba's entire electrical grid was knocked out on Tuesday night, and um, and this thing is strengthening as it enters Florida. It's going to essentially hover over Florida, apparently, for the next 72 hours or so. According to the latest tracking models, it's not going to actually come off the east coast of Florida until basically midday on Thursday. So the, one of the big problems here is that it's not ripping through particularly quickly. It's really taking its time as it moves over the state. It's going to cause extraordinary loss of of property. We'll see how many lives it costs. Now, normally in these situations, when you have a natural disaster, everybody sort of comes together no matter your political persuasion. Unfortunately, we now live in a country where this is no longer the case because the governor of Florida is Ron DeSantis. This means that he's very good and no bad. So look for very hot takes from the media about how this is all Ron DeSantis' fault, both because of global warming and also because Ron DeSantis is a very bad man. There's sort of pagan element that has taken over the radical left that suggests that things like COVID, natural disasters, this is actually 
some sort of divine revenge for right wing governance, but only when it strikes a right wing area. When it strikes a left wing area, then we don't know why such a thing would happen. When it strikes a right wing area, it must be because the gods of COVID have descended or because the hurricanes have decided to punish Ron DeSantis or some such nonsense. The reality is, of course, a natural disaster is a natural disaster. And thoughts, prayers, resources all need to go toward the people who are directly in the path of this thing. Ron DeSantis yesterday, the governor of Florida, he warned of the conditions across the state. Schools across the state have been shut down. People are staying home. He was warning people, if you're directly in the pathway of the storm, to get out as fast as possible. Here was the governor yesterday. There's still uncertainty with where that exact landfall will be, uh, but just understand the impacts are going to be far, far broader uh, than just where the eye of the storm happens to make landfall. Uh, in some areas, there will be catastrophic flooding and life-threatening storm surge. And so if you're on Florida's Gulf Coast, uh, from Naples all the way through the Tampa Bay area and some of the counties north of that, uh, that could be something uh, that happens. And, and it will certainly happen uh, in some parts of Florida's Gulf Coast. And meanwhile, the president of the United States said that his administration was on alert to help the people of Florida. Here was President Biden yesterday. My administration is on alert and in action to help the people of Florida. I've approved Florida's request for emergency assistance immediately upon receiving it from the governor when they received it. And I directed my team to surge federal assistance there before the storm hit. FEMA has already deployed 700 personnel to Florida, and the governor has activated 5,000 state National Guard with another 2,000 guards coming from other states. There was some controversy yesterday, given the fact that President Biden through most of yesterday, had not called Governor DeSantis, which is not the usual procedure. Normally, the first person you call when there is a hurricane about to hit a state is the governor of that state. According to The New York Post, President Biden called three Florida mayors on Tuesday as Hurricane Ian neared Florida's West Coast hours before reaching out to Republican Governor Ron DeSantis. Apparently, he first spoke with Tampa Mayor Jane Castor, St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg Mayor Ken Welch, Clearwater Mayor Frank Hibbert, Castor and Welch are Democrats. Hibbert is a Republican. The president waited a fairly long time to call. This prompted the FEMA administrator to have to go on national television and explain why Joe Biden had not called Ron DeSantis as of yet. As we say, Biden corrected that late afternoon after there was enormous blowback for him not calling Ron DeSantis because the two obviously are political rivals. Here was the FEMA administrator trying to explain this away. We've made conversations with the mayors. So is there any reason why not the governor? Again, we have a strong team that's in place supporting the governor right now, working side by side with him and his staff. We'll continue to stay engaged with and him. So that would be avoiding the question, obviously. Joe Biden was under pressure to call DeSantis. So, in fact, he did call DeSantis again. This is like baseline, baseline sort of stuff. Apparently, according to the White House Press Secretary, Corinne Jean-Pierre, the steps the federal government is taking to help Florida prepare for Hurricane Ian were discussed. The president and governor committed to continue close coordination now, this is not the first time that DeSantis has handled some sort of crisis in his state, but a crisis of this magnitude is a completely different beast. Obviously, in Florida, we've had the Surfside building collapse where a couple of hundred people were killed when buildings on the beach just fell down, like literally just fell down. And Governor DeSantis handled, handled that very well. This, however, is a major hurricane and is going to cause complete chaos in the state because, again, you're talking about a hurricane that's essentially the size of Hurricane Katrina because it's trending toward a Cat 5 as it nears very, very populated areas. Now, this has not stopped the media from immediately jumping into, let's discuss this through a political lens, because this is, this is what they do, of course. So one member of the media tried to say to Ron DeSantis that he had not actually prepped for the hurricane, which, of course, is really silly. DeSantis has been warning for days. I mean, even before I went into the holiday of Rosh Hashanah, there were warnings from DeSantis and, and the governor's team about if you're in the path of the hurricane, get ready to leave, make sure that you batten down the hatches, make sure that you have all the resources necessary. A media member tried to go after DeSantis on this yesterday and DeSantis just clocked him. FEMA Administrator Chris Wells said today that she acknowledged concerns that of Florida's, as was said, lacks response to the storm so far and that- Whoa, some whoa, folks whoa, whoa. give there. me a break. That is nonsense. Stop politicizing, okay? Stop it. We declared a state of emergency when this thing wasn't even formed. We've had people in here. You've had counties doing. Uh, they've done a lot of hard work. And, and honestly, you're trying to attack me, I get. But, like, you're attacking these other people who've worked very hard. And so, so that's just totally false. Um, I don't think we've ever, certainly since I've been governor, declared a state of emergency this early. Uh, we made sure that we were very inclusive with it. We said that there was a lot of uncertainty. And, and we've worked to make sure um, the preparations that have been done and all the this stuff, you talk to the people at the 
the counties when they've needed something, stuff gets there very quickly because of what Kevin and his team have done. Yeah, and the members of the media who are more radical are doing exactly what you would think they would be doing. MSNBC's Joy Reid, who's one of the worst people in all of media, she suggested that this is going to test Ron DeSantis because after all, he's a bad, bad Republican man who's bad. Here's Joy Reid yesterday. Florida prepares for a monster storm with landfall expected tomorrow. Governor Ron DeSantis is going to be put to the test, forced to actually do his job when he's used to spending most of his time hanging out on Fox News and owning the libs. Is he up to the task? It's just unbelievable. I'm sorry. Ron DeSantis has an approval rating well above 50 percent in the state. He's going to win re-election in a walk come November. Any governor who's in charge of a major state in the middle of a natural disaster is put to the test. The notion that Ron DeSantis' chief mode of governance in Florida has been to go on Fox News is an absurdity, but it is pure joy read to suggest, of course, that this is really the first time that Ron DeSantis has ever been put to the test. Meanwhile, Don Lemon over on CNN tried to do the routine that we frequently hear with regard to global warming, which is anytime there's a singular weather event that is really out of the box and, and kind of crazy, whether it's a freeze in Texas or whether it's a large hurricane about to hit Tampa, we hear people in the media immediately jump to, this must be due to climate change and global warming. Now, here is the deal with climate change and global warming. You cannot trace any single weather event to climate change. It's not possible. Everybody, every climatologist will tell you this is not climate denial. This is simple fact. Climate is weather over a large period of time. Any single weather event cannot be traced to a, a singular trend. There is just no way to do that. But members of the media, because all they do all day is, is just respond to headlines, what they like to do is if there is a singular weather event, they immediately start saying, well, this is because of global warming. Well, you know, I live in Florida. Up until now, this is an extraordinarily calm hurricane season. I mean, there's literally nothing up until now. And last year was a pretty calm hurricane season. In fact, what the data tends to show is that there's very little correlation between the frequency of hurricanes and global warming entirely. And when it comes to the amount of damage done by hurricanes, that has been going down fairly consistently. If it goes up, it's typically because the hurricane is hitting a very populated area. So if people build directly in the path of a hurricane, then the damage numbers go up. But that has little to do, it's called the target effect. It has very little to do with the intensity of the hurricanes. 300 years ago, if a Cat 5 hurricane hit Florida, it hit like seven people. Today, if a Cat 5 hurricane hits Florida, it's going to hit three, four million people. So obviously, the amount of damage is going to go up, even if the frequency of the hurricanes is the same or lower or the intensity is the same or lower. But people in the media don't actually want to give you the truth about what global warming does and, and what can be traced to global warming. So instead, what they point out is that when there is a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, and it moves over warm water, it tends to intensify. And so because of global warming, that means that the water is warmer. So that means that the hurricane is more intense. The question is more intense than what? Because that water has been warm for a very, very long time in human history. The Gulf of Mexico has been known for its warm waters for pretty much as long as we've known about the Gulf of Mexico. And beyond that, there is no actual, uh, there's no actual data demonstrating that hurricanes are becoming more frequent. Anyway, put all that aside. Don Lemon thinks that he knows things. So there's this extraordinarily funny exchange last night on CNN. Don Lemon had on the NOAA administrator. Okay, this is the actual, this person works for Joe Biden's administration, the head of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Okay, and, uh, and Don Lemon decided to ask him about global warming. And uh, it didn't go amazing for Don Lemon. Here was, uh, here was Don Lemon. Listen, I just, I'm just trying to get that you said you want to talk about climate change, but what, what effect does climate change have on this phenomenon that, that is happening now? Because it seems these storms are intensifying. That's the question. Here. I don't think you can link climate change to any one event. Okay. On the whole, on the cumulative, uh, climate change uh, may be making storms worse, uh, but uh, to link it to any one event, um, I, I would caution against that. Okay. Well, they, uh, listen, I grew up there, and these storms are intensifying. Something is causing them to in intensify. I got to say, that's really, really funny. Because... So just to get that straight, that was the NOAA administrator saying what I said, right? You can't trace any singular weather event to global warming. And Tom, Don Lemon's like, yes, but I, I am from Florida, and this is worse than it was when I was a kid. That's, I'm sorry, that, that is not actual data, Don. Okay, you, you know, when, when you were a kid, all the adults looked enormous. That doesn't mean that the adults got smaller as you got older. Like, uh, this is so stupid. This is how members of our media treat childhood members. Like, well, you know, when I was a kid, it used to snow even harder. I mean, I remember the snowdrifts being like eight feet tall, right? Because you were two and a half feet tall. That, that would be the reason, right? <laughs> These are the people who love the science. Okay, so bottom line in all of this, don't follow any of the politicization. There's going to be an extraordinarily large-scale attempt 
to preemptively claim that Ron DeSantis has botched the hurricane. Because I remember when they did this to George W. Bush, Hurricane Katrina, that was really botched by state and local authorities. The problem was that the local authorities in New Orleans were Democrats. The governor was a Democrat, but George W. Bush was a Republican. So it became a national issue. And so on this one, watch for the media to immediately spin into Ron DeSantis is a terrible person. It's all his fault. If somebody got killed in Tampa, it's because Ron DeSantis didn't nuke the hurricane or something. Like it, it, That is where this is going. So just be on the lookout for that sort of media coverage because it is just inaccurate. And in the meantime, if you're a decent person, pray for the people who are actually in the path of a major hurricane that likely will be tearing roofs off of buildings and harming a great number of people. And if you have it in your in your budget to, to give some charity, do that too. That'd be an actual useful thing that you can do over the next 72 hours, as opposed to watching the dullards over at CNN and MSNBC blame Ron DeSantis for a natural disaster that is rather actually frequent when it comes to the Gulf Coast. Okay, meanwhile, over in Virginia, the Democrats are fighting mad. They're fighting mad because Glenn Youngkin is actually keeping one of his promises. One of his promises is that he is not going to allow transgender policy to change how children go to school. So what he means by this is that he is no longer going to allow people who simply identify as a member of the opposite sex to walk into the bathrooms at public schools. And this follows hot on the heels of a story that was largely broken by the Daily Wire in which a student dressed in a skirt allegedly went into a girl's bathroom and sexually assaulted a girl. And so... And then was told by the school board in Loudoun County, this sort of stuff never happens. If you have transgender bathrooms, it really is no problem whatsoever. So Glenn Youngkin has now changed the policy and he has gone back to the original policy, which until the last five minutes was considered not only normal, but perfectly logical that boys should go pee pee in the boys room and girls should go pee pee in the girls room and that boys should not go pee pee in the girls room just because they say that they are, are boys and that girls should not go pee pee in the boys room because they're not capable of using the urinal. I mean, like th this is this is really not difficult stuff, but apparently it's now driving outsized outrage. So according to BuzzFeed News, students at almost 100 schools in Virginia on Tuesday participated in walkouts to protest a proposed policy put forward by Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin that would heavily restrict the rights of transgender students in public. How about the rights of girls not to be in a bathroom with a teenage boy? That seems like a pretty big right, but apparently no. No right to privacy for girls who actually would like to, you know, go to the bathroom in peace have a teenage boy in there saying he's a girl. No, no, no. They, they have no rights. It's only this particular set of people who apparently has rights. Under the new policy, parents would be given the decision-making power about whether their child expresses a gender that differs with their child's sex while at school and what pronouns their child uses at school, because this is the other part of the policy the left really objects to. The left would like to kidnap your children and allow the teachers at the NEA to explain to your kids that they actually are a member of the opposite sex to socially transition them at school and to never tell you. This is the left's actual position. Okay, this is the position of people who are opposing Youngkin's policy, because all Youngkin's policy says is that if a kid comes to school and says, I'm Bob, but I'd like to be called Jill, that you have to call the parents and tell them. Apparently, this is very bad, according to the left. You should socially transition them at school. And if you refuse to socially transition them, then this means that you're a bigot. And you should definitely not tell the parents because you never know. Bob might go home and mom and dad might take out the belt. So the teachers are your real parents. Randy Weingarten is, is really your parent. Horrific, childless Randy Weingarten, who, who again, is... Her relationship to children over the past couple of years has been to simply prevent them from going to school and wreck their lives and force them to wear masks at two years old. She should be in charge of your children. That, that is the person who matters most of all. The proposal says that a student's legal name and sex cannot be changed without an official legal document or court order, which makes a lot of sense. Right? You can't just come in and tell the teachers one day that you should be called Ji Jim with and and. Your, your new name will be trans dinosaur and they just start calling you that stuff. Instead, you actually have to go through a legal process to change your name like, you know, you would in a normal country. And the, the, the policy says the teachers and other school officials must refer to each student using only the pronouns appropriate to the sex appearing in the student's official record. In other words, if the student comes in and says, I'm a Jim and the teacher looks at you and you're a boy, the teacher is perfectly well within his rights and, and should, in fact, call you he him. Transgender students would also be forced to use school facilities that match the sex assigned to them at birth. So the original policy from Democratic Governor Ralph Northam, who is uh, quite fond of the idea that, that abortion should be allowed up to and including apparently after birth, allowed schools to let students use their chosen names and pronouns that reflect their gender identity with ne without needing any legal documentation. So a bunch of these students walked out. All that's happening right here is that a bunch of teachers who work for the NEA decided to rabble rouse among the students. Then the students are like, hey, I get out of class. This is how protests work, by the way, when you're in high school. Very few of these students are really, really involved with these issues. The number of trans students in Virginia is vanishingly low. 
But if you can get a teacher to excuse you from class, are you going to go or are you not going to go? Are you going to stay in class and do your math homework? Or are you actually going to you know, walk out of the school and pretend that you're a social justice warrior? According to BuzzFeed News, so often in issues around education, students are excluded from the conversation, especially queer students. Yes, if there's one thing we know about America, it's that LGBTQ people don't get enough media coverage. They, they've totally been excluded from the conversation. They're, they're utterly silent in our, in our media landscape. This is according to 17-year-old Casey Calabia, who helped organize and participate in the walk on Tuesday. Getting this opportunity to have people listen to what we have to say all across Virginia is really imperative to making sure we're not excluded from conversations that will quite literally change our day-to-day lives. More on this in just one second. But first, did you know that thread count is a myth? Turns out it doesn't matter how many threads your sheets have if they are not the best quality threads possible. Bull and Branch uses the best 100% organic cotton threads on earth for a superior softness and a better night's sleep. Their sheets aren't just buttery, breathable, and impossibly soft to start. They get softer with every single wash. In fact, Bull and Branch sheets are so good, I literally cannot sleep in other sheets. They kind of ruined all other sheets for me. The signature hem sheets from Bull and Branch are a bestseller for a reason. Not only do they use the best quality threads, threads so luxurious they're beloved by three U.S. presidents, they also actually fit your mattress the way they are supposed to. There's nothing more irritating to me than when I'm on my bed and the sheet pops off the mattress and suddenly my face is directly on the mattress. Like, eh. Bowling Branch, that's never going to happen because their signature sheets are properly fitted. Those hem sheets are great. Best of all, Bowling Branch gives you a 30-night risk-free trial with free shipping and returns on all orders. They fit the deepest of mattresses. They are labeled with top and bottom tags, making your bed is easier than ever. Get 15% off your first set of sheets when you use promo code Shapiro at bowlandbranch.com. That's B-O-L-L-A-N-D branch.com, promo code Shapiro. You may have noticed that the economy seems to be on the tipping point lately. We are probably already in a recession. We already have massive inflation. But if you haven't looked over your budget in a while to see how you can save on your bills, you really should, especially because you may have racked up that credit card debt and that can just eat you alive. Right now, you might need to access the equity you have in your house. If you're a homeowner, your equity is up 20% since last year. That equity can be accessed as cash for all the things you need. Just call American Financing, get that free mortgage review I've been telling you about. American Financing looks at your entire financial picture from your home loans, your equity, even your high interest debt. They'll review all of it. They'll do everything they can to help you save up to $1,000 per month. What would you do with that extra savings? Well, even if your credit isn't great, you can call them and see what they can do. It only takes 10 minutes. Call 866-721-3300. That's 866-721-3300 or visit AmericanFinancing.net, NMLS 182-334, NMLSConsumerAccess.org. Again, if you are running behind that eight ball because your bills and you need access to some cash right now, you need to talk with my friends over American Financing. Give them a call at 866-721-3300 or visit AmericanFinancing.net. Now, it is not just a bunch of foolish youngsters who are walking out of class to protest this, or their teachers, as pushed by the National Education Association of the American Federation of Teachers, run by people, again, like Randy Weingarten. It is also the actual White House of the United States. And this is the important thing to remember when it comes to social policy of the left in the United States. It is promoted at the most radical levels by the most radical people with the most radical power. I mean, you're talking about the president of the United States promoting the idea that if your 15-year-old girl goes to school because, and she's gender confused for any reason whatsoever, because she's been watching TikTok. She goes to school and she says, I wish to be treated as a member of the opposite sex. All of the teachers, all the other students should be forced to say that she is a boy and parents should not be ta- told about this because after all, the parents might be, this is like the policy of the White House in the United States. And here's Corinne Jean-Pierre saying just that yesterday. Students across Virginia today walked out of their classroom to protest the governor's new guidelines restricting the rights of transgender students. Does the White House support these students? We believe and he believes transgender youth uh, should be uh, allowed to, to, be, uh, to be able uh, to go to school freely, to be able to express themselves freely, uh, to be able to have the protections that they need to be who they are. Uh, again, I have not seen these reports, but I can, uh, we can say uh, with all confidence, uh, and you all know have covered him for some time, uh, when it comes to this community, he is a, a partner and he is a strong ally. Okay, so parents should not be part of the conversation. Teachers. Joe Biden should be your old grandpa telling you that you're actually a member of the opposite sex. Glenn Youngkin, new governor of Virginia, elected on precisely this basis. Glenn Youngkin, he came back at this pretty easily. He's like, uh, so basically you're saying you want to cut parents out of the loop. If you're against the guidelines, it means you're against having parents involved in students' lives. And I don't think that's where Virginia is. Virginia spoke loudly last year in our election that, that parents were really important to have involved in kids' lives. And so I think this is a chance for us to reflect, please read the guidelines, and then uh, work towards making sure that we do include parents in these fundamentally important decisions. Okay, but the fact is that our elite case in the United States, 
They, they actually just believe that they should be able to run social policy top down. And this isn't just true for social policy. It's obviously true for economic policy as well. The only problem is they've botched it every way it is possible to botch this thing. So on the domestic front, obviously, you've seen the Federal Reserve keep those in, in these inflation rates incredibly high by keeping the interest rates incredibly low for far too long. And this has now led them to have to ramp up those interest rates really fast. And this means, of course, that we are likely to see a significantly harder landing than would otherwise be the case. And they're going to have to ramp it up even faster. According to Susan Collins, the new president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, Wall Street Journal reporting, she said she is committed to bringing inflation down to 2%, even if it means slowing the economy. Collins, in her first public remarks as Boston Fed leader, said Monday she supported further interest rate increases as projected by Federal Reserve officials last week. They showed the central bank raising aggressively through next year despite rising fears of an economic slowdown or recession. She said in a speech prepared for delivery Monday at the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, quote, accomplishing price stability will require slower employment growth and a somewhat higher unemployment rate. Returning inflation to target will require further tightening of monetary policy. She said history has shown price stability is a precondition to achieving maximum employment over the medium and longer term. This, of course, is exactly right. The only problem is that this would have been completely unnecessary if it hadn't been for the Federal Reserve botching this thing and for the Biden administration pouring money, just pouring it almost physically into the American economy. Meanwhile, home prices have started to dump. So this this increase in interest rates is starting to bite in the economy. We've seen these the fastest slowdown in home pricing in, I think, my lifetime at this point, actually. According to the Wall Street Journal, U.S. home prices slid in July from June, the first monthly decline in years, and the latest sign that higher mortgage rates are starting to weigh on home prices in many of the country's biggest markets. Home prices are still rising on a year-over-year basis, even though the pace of of growth has slowed. The national index rose 15.8% in the year that ended in July, down from an 18.1% annual rate the prior month. Housing economists expect home price growth to slow significantly by the end of the year. July's report reflects a forceful declaration, said Craig Lazera, managing director at S&P Dow Jones Indices. As the Federal Reserve continues to move interest rates upward, mortgage financing has become significantly more expensive. We now have mortgage rates that in many cases are exceeding 7%. Yeah, like a year ago, it was 2 3%. We were talking about historic lows. Now we are talking about highs that we haven't seen in most of my lifetime. So the experts are doing an amazing job. Well, Larry Summers, who's warning about all this, former Clinton Treasury Secretary, he said yesterday, listen, a hard landing is extremely likely at this point. Neil said that unless we get a miracle on the supply side, or unless we get a lot of happy news on the supply side, it's likely to be a hard landing. I think that's right. And I don't know what reason there is for thinking that we're going to get some kind of sudden major increase in productivity. I supported the Inflation Reduction Act and a number of other uh, steps that are directed at uh, strengthening the economy's potential. But none of those policies have serious arguments associated with them that they're going to produce huge supply side benefits uh, quickly. Okay, well. With all of that said, the administration's take on this is not that they actually are going to get things under control. It's that they're going to blame Vladimir Putin. Now, as I've said before, if you are not a fan of Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine, as pretty much everybody is not a fan of Vladimir Putin's invasion of, of Ukraine, the stupidest thing you could do to undermine that, the, the support for the pushback, is to blame all economic problems on that invasion, because that would obviously suggest that the way to bring those economic problems to an end would be to come to a negotiated agreement, which, by the way, may be correct, but that's not the position of this administration. So Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, he continues to suggest that all economic problems on planet Earth are basically due to the Russian war in Ukraine, which is not true. OK, just on a, on a fiscal level, it is not true. We had massive inflation in the run up to the war in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine has exacerbated a lot of those problems, but it, it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. What matters to Tony Blinken and the Biden administration is finding someone to blame who is not the experts, who is not them. We saw the aggression, the threat of the aggression mounting from Russia against Ukraine last year. We warned the world about it and we tried everything possible to avert it through diplomacy. Unfortunately, tragically, President Putin pursued his aggression nonetheless. And now the Ukrainian people, but also the world, are reaping the consequences. We're seeing the consequences in everything from rising food insecurity to the energy prices that we've talked about. So it's profoundly in everyone's interest 
for Russia to stop its aggression. Okay, well, you, you can lecture Russia as much as you want, but the fact is that Russia's not going to stop this unless they have some sort of off ramp. So once again, the experts are wrong. Okay, the experts keep saying that the harder we push Russia here, the better it's going to be. The reality is that some off ramp is going to have to be provided at some point here, or things are going to get an awful lot worse. Vladimir Putin right now, he is staked his entire legacy on not completely losing the war in Ukraine, which means he is threatening tactical battlefield nuclear weapons. He is also calling up a million reservists. And people who are trying to leave the country to avoid being called up are now being arrested. Meanwhile, Russia yesterday ran a sham referendum in the areas that it, that it annexed, in which it essentially claimed that these are now parts of Russia. According to the Wall Street Journal, Russia is set to formally annex occupied territories in Ukraine after staging referenda that involved coercion threats and in some places, soldiers going door to door and forcing people to vote at gunpoint. One of the things that, that I always find really funny about these forced votes is if you're going to do a forced vote, shouldn't you at least give it the appearance that it's contested? And like, why bother having a vote if the results are going to be 99% in favor of annexation? Like, why do you even bother doing that? It makes no sense at all. If you're trying to fake an election to make it look as though you are going to, as though you're going through some sort of democratic process, wouldn't you be like, oh, it's a 63, 37 result. Instead, they're like, what if we go 99% in favor of annexation? Then everyone will believe that it was a free and fair election. Kiev and Western governments have described the vote as a sham designed to confer a veneer of legitimacy to Moscow's seizure of Ukrainian land seven months on from its invasion. They could also enable Moscow to claim any effort by Ukrainian forces to recapture the territories amounts to an attack on Russia itself. That would be the idea is that now you've invaded Russia because we claim this territory. And so we're going to come in. We're going to reinvade into Ukraine because you're now the aggressors. Residents in the occupied area said Russian soldiers compelled them to vote guns drawn in a choreographed show of support for Moscow's plan to make their regions part of Russia. They said some Russian sympathizers were brought in from other regions to cast their votes at polling places to create the impression that it was, in fact, a regular vote. The official results ended on Tuesday afternoon. And again, basically 100% support. According to official results, 93% of voters in Russian-controlled parts of the Zaporizhia region checked the box in favor of joining Russia. In Luhansk, it was 91%. In Kherson, it was 87%. Yeah, man, th th those are not real results, obviously. But none of that matters. What really matters here is that Russia continues to make aggressive moves. Meanwhile, Things are, are getting extraordinarily dicey over in Europe with regard to oil and, and natural gas supplies going into the winter. Very mysterious and bizarre circumstances happening with the Nord Stream pipeline. According to the New York Times, explosions under the Baltic Sea and the rupture of major natural gas pipelines from Russia to Germany appeared to be a deliberate attack, officials across Europe said on Tuesday, deepening uncertainty about European energy security amid soaring prices and fears of running short of fuel over the winter. This is so weird because, again, Russia controls Nord Streams 1 and 2. So if they wish to simply shut off the gas, as they've done before, they could. Or maybe they just don't want to be fined by the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund or something, and so they're faking it. But it's really unclear at this point why exactly they would blow up their own pipelines. But that seems to be the going theory in Western circles, is that it is not, in fact, a, a Ukrainian attack or an American attack, that it's somehow uh, a Russian attack on their own pipelines. Again, very strange scenario. According to the New York Times, three separate leaks erupted from both Nord Stream 1 and 2, which were already caught up in the conflict over Russia's invasion of Ukraine, sending swirling steams of methane to the surface of the waters off Denmark and Sweden. Top Polish and Ukrainian officials blame Moscow. Russian state media suggested U.S. or Ukrainian involvement. Denmark's prime minister, Mette Fredriksen, told reporters while on a trip to Poland to open a new undersea pipeline that will carry Norwegian gas. It's hard to imagine that it's accidental. On Tuesday evening, Jake Sullivan the president's national security advisor called the incident apparent sabotage in a tweet. Again, unclear exactly why Russia would sabotage its own pipelines. They, they've done this sort of thing only in the sense that they, they've suggested, oh, we had a pipeline breakdown. Oops, not our fault. Oh, that's so sad. Well, you know, so you don't have your gas. Oh, that's, that's too bad. It's possible they're doing this again. But again, if Russia really wants to essentially broaden its war to Europe, there's no reason for them to actually break the pipeline. Apparently, Nord Stream 2 had never gone into service, so it really didn't have any immediate effect on the oil supply, Nord Stream 1 has been shut down since August. But the leaks hammered home the message that Europe and its energy infrastructure are vulnerable, even if Europe succeeds in its mission of weaning itself off of Russian energy. The CIA had warned in June that Nord Stream pipelines could be attacked. They declined to say whether that warning identified Russia as a possible attacker. They had reached no conclusion about who is responsible. Bottom line is things are going to get a lot more dicey in this region. And the more the experts tell you that everything is hunky-dory over there, the more you should start to uh, check for your wallet. You know, I got to tell you, my sleep quality a few weeks ago when I was overseas, it was not that great. And one of the reasons for that, I did not have my personalized mattress, the one that made me sleep the best I can sleep on planet Earth. That, of course, is my Helix sleep mattress. Helix is so good. Not only have I been on a Helix sleep mattress for years along with my wife, but also 
I bought one for my parents. I bought a couple for my sisters. Helix has several different mattress models to choose from. They've got soft, medium, and firm mattresses. Mattress is great for cooling you down if you sleep hot. Mattress is great for spinal alignment, prevent morning aches and pains, even that Helix Plus mattress for plus size sleepers. If you're nervous about buying a mattress online, you don't have to be. Helix has a sleep quiz, matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress, because why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? I took that Helix quiz. I was matched with a model that is firm and yet breathable. I tend to get back pain if the mattress is too soft and I heat up like a lot at night. So I need a mattress that is made just for me. They've got a 10-year warranty. You can try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it. But again, I'm not sure this has ever happened. They have over 12,000 five-star reviews. For a limited time, Helix is offering up to 350 bucks off all mattress orders, plus two free pillows for our listeners. It's their best offer yet. Hurry on over to helixsleep.com slash Ben. Meanwhile, when Harry's Razors pulled its ads from our site, we decided to fight fire with fire. That's how Jeremy's Razors came to be. Truthfully, sticking it to a woke company is its own reward, but we are taking it to a whole new level with Jeremy's Razors Contest for the Car. Here's how it works for every single person you refer. Whether they buy a Jeremy's Razors kit or a Daily Wire annual membership, you both get points in the race to win the God King's McLaren. Yeah, you know that commercial where he's driving around like a $250,000 car? You could win that magical car. You might win a car that goes from zero to like a billion miles an hour in about three seconds. I feel like someone in my audience could be the big winner. It can't be me because I'm constitutionally barred from doing that. It's just corrupt. But it could be you if you sell enough of those Jeremy's Razors kits to your friends or a Daily Wire annual membership. Head on over to jeremysrazors.com slash play. Most of the top players have not even hit 20 referrals yet. So, I mean, if you can find 20 of your friends to do it, you could win like a quarter million dollar car, which seems like a pretty solid deal. There's plenty of time for you to jump in the race and win it. The competition ends November 1, 2022. Get going today. See terms and conditions for complete details at jeremysrazors.com slash referral terms. The program is only open to legal U.S. residents residing in the United States, D.C., excluding residents of Colorado, Connecticut, Maryland, Puerto Rico, and U.S. territories and possessions 18 and older. Remember, friends do not let friends shave with woke razors. Meanwhile, these same experts who have presided over record inflation, they presided over the slowing of the economy. They presided over the blowing out of the Western debt. And they're presiding over radical increases in energy prices. They continue to maintain that the most important thing in the world for Western citizens is climate change. They continue to pretend that this is a thing. So Janet Yellen, who apparently may be on her way out, the, the Secretary of the Treasury, formerly a, a not particularly good Federal Reserve President, she says that climate change is the biggest threat to everyone on the planet, the climate. Let me touch on the risks of climate change to our economy. Of course, unmitigated climate change is an existential threat to everyone on our planet. In a world that continues to warm, regions that are prosperous today may eventually become unsuited for productive economic activity. In many regions, human mortality is projected to rise and labor productivity to fall with the size of the impacts depending on the degree of warming. Okay, so again, they're just going to continue to push on climate change. Now, the general publics in these areas, I have a question, general publics in, in Europe, in the United States, are we supposed to believe that the top issue for these publics right now are things like transing the children, climate change, blowing out the spending and handing it over to experts? Is this really the thing that we're supposed to believe? Because it's not true. It turns out that we had elite global left wing rule during COVID and people didn't like it. They didn't like it so much that one of the most popular people on the world scene, Jacinda Ardern, who is the New Zealand prime minister, you'll remember her as the great heroine of COVID, right? Everybody on the left in the media, they suggested she was amazing because she shut down the island where the hobbits are. And she said that no one could come in and that no one could go out. And then she stopped death, except that she didn't vaccinate anybody. And so when COVID actually hit the island, there were some people who actually died. Well, now Jacinda Ardern, she continues to call for social media crackdowns because it turns out that leftism, when people are actually made aware of its consequences, people don't like it very much. So here was Ardern yesterday suggesting that she needs social media crackdown. So combine all of these issues, climate change. She said, by the way, this is the reason, by the way, she says that there ought to be social media crackdowns so people can't freely discuss issues surrounding climate change. Because if you're going to transform the world economy on the basis that over the next hundred years, the climate is going to warm somewhat slightly, then you have to be like, if that's how you're going to, you, you do need to shut down the free speech mechanisms because no one is going to buy that. Here is Jacinda Ardern, New Zealand prime minister and great heroine of the left. This week, we launched an initiative alongside companies and nonprofits 
to help improve research and understanding of how a person's online experiences are curated by automated processes. This will also be important in understanding more about mis- and disinformation online, a challenge that we must, as leaders, address. I can say with complete certainty that we cannot ignore it. To do so poses an equal threat to the norms we all value. After all, how do you successfully end a war if people are led to believe the reason for its existence is not only legal but noble? How do you tackle climate change if people do not believe it exists? How do you ensure the human rights of others are upheld when they are subjected to hateful and dangerous rhetoric and ideology? Ah, so just shut down free speech. You'll notice that on the back of bad policy always comes the call to shut down free speech. Jacinda Ardern, again, remember, a year and a half ago, she was the greatest hero of the West. I mean, CNN would play clips of her, MSNBC would play clips of her. They're not playing clips of her now because she's about to lose an election. According to One News in New Zealand, Labour leader Jacinda Ardern has remained steady in her preferred prime minister rating, but Nationals, Christopher Luxon, is, is, he's dipped a little bit. It doesn't matter because the National Party is now outranking Labour. The National Party is at 37%, Labour is at 34%. In the party results, again, National with the ACT has a plurality. Labor with the Green Party is coming in second right now. So this means that translated to seats, Jacinda Ardern does not end up in the majority here. So the, the, this unbelievably popular left-wing politician is now not particularly popular. It turns out that people, basically left-wing governance, it, it's, it's essentially like a temporary high. It's like you took a pill. They have a temporary high and everything feels amazing. And then the come down in the morning is just brutal. And people are reacting to that. And that is what you're seeing internationally. So now you're starting to see a reaction internationally. As we'll talk about in a second, the reaction to the reaction is that everybody who doesn't like left-wing governance is a fascist. This is the way this works. But internationally speaking, what we are watching is a right-wing move, a right-wing nationalist move. And this is across the board. So one of the figures who is now leading this is the new prime minister of Italy, a woman named Giorgia Maloney. So Maloney is not, in fact, a fascist. There's an attempt to paint her as such. She is not. Giorgia Maloney is the head of the Brothers of Italy. They carry 26% of the vote in Italy. The other conservative parties brought the total up to 44%. So she is the undisputed leader of a conservative coalition that will have a majority in Italy's new parliament. The media immediately, because this is what they do, she, her main pitch, this is the pitch that she's making. It's making her popular with, with right-wingers in the United States. Her pitch is family, God, country, right? Things that... that the right has been castigated for in the United States. People on the left are, of course, calling her Benito Mussolini. So what exactly makes her Benito Mussolini? Well, uh, here is a clip of Georgia Maloney speaking in 2019 at a, at a conference about family. And let's just say that there are a lot of people across the world who are not on board with the climate change, open borders, trans the children agenda of the international left. And she speaks pretty well for a lot of those people. She says, this is about what we are doing here today. Why is the family an enemy? Why is the family frightening? There's a single answer to all these questions. Because it defines us. Because it is our identity. Because everything that defines us is now an enemy. For those who would like us to no longer have an identity. And to simply be perfect consumer slaves. So they attack national identity, they attack religious identity, they attack gender identity, they attack family identity. I can't define myself as Italian Christian woman mother, no. I must be a citizen X, gender X, parent one, parent two, I must be a number. Because when I'm only a number, when I no longer have an identity or roots, then I will be the perfect slave at the mercy of financial speculators. The perfect consumer. That's the reason why we inspire so much fear. That's why this event inspires so much fear. Because we do not want to be numbers. We'll defend the value of the human being. Every single human being, because each of us has a unique genetic code that is unrepeatable. And like it or not, that is sacred. We will defend it. We'll defend God, country, and family. Those things that disgust people so much. We'll do it to defend our freedom because we'll never be slaves and simple consumers at the mercy of financial speculators. That is our mission. That's why I came here today. 
She quotes G.K. Chesterton, famous British conservative. She says, Fires will be kindled to testify that two and two make four. Sores will be drawn to prove that leaves are green in summer. That time has arrived. We are ready. Thank you. Okay, so this speech went completely viral on the right for a reason. And when she's talking about the attack on family, the attack on traditional rules and institutions, people all over the West resonate to that. Now, her little spin there, that the reason that people are doing this is because there's sort of a global capitalist order that is driving people to be individualist consumers. That is a very sort of fundamentalist integralist idea that has taken root on, on parts of the nationalist right. But she also happens to be a fan of like tax cuts and more financial freedom in Italy because Italy is heavily, heavily regulated. So again, you can hold by the idea of individual property rights and also that those individual property rights must be undergirded by institutions that promote virtue. Right? That is actually the theory of Adam Smith. Adam, Adam Smith, arch capitalist, right? he is the person who wrote before Wealth of Nations a theory of moral sentiments, right? which is all about the idea that morality has to actually undergird the markets in order for the markets to properly work. Alrighty, guys, we have run out of time. We're going to be getting into a lot more, including the left's reaction to the right's reaction, namely everyone we don't like is a fascist. You're not going to want to miss it. Click the link in the description and join us.